The amount of opportunity that exists right now for someone who's good, who has wanted that next step to become a roaster, a trainer, a general manager, where they can make significantly more money has never been seen before. There really, really is a shortage of staff. Yes, um, I really can't state that strongly enough. We estimate it to be around 200,000 roles that are, are empty at the moment. At the moment, with the problems with COVID and Brexit, to keep these staff, you need to invoke loyalty. You need to you know, make sure that they are feeling valued. One of the things I hear constantly is, oh, how are we going to attract the right people with the right skill set? And I would say at Gales, our focus has always been to attract the right people who will fit well in our culture and really get what we want to do. Welcome back to the Fifth Wave podcast. I'm Jeffrey Young, Editor-in-Chief of Coffee Business Magazine, Fifth Wave. Today, we're exploring the staffing crisis affecting hospitality businesses globally. We're going to unpack the impacts of COVID, Brexit for our UK listeners, and also the long-term challenge of developing meaningful careers within the hospitality space. How long will this situation continue to be a problem for our industry? And what solutions can operators put into practice today to attract and retain the best and brightest long-term talent? We'll be hearing from two established hospitality businesses to unpack these questions. Jonathan Rubenstein, founder and CEO of Joe Coffee in New York City, and Jessica Warden, head of Coffee for Gales in the UK. Before that, though, we're going to zero in on the problem. We'll be speaking with Freddie Speed, a very talented hospitality professional who has decided to take a pause from the hospitality industry. But to kick things off, we're speaking with Tony Sophocleides, Strategic Affairs Director for UK Hospitality. Tony gives us a macro overview on the staffing shortages in the UK right now. As the name suggests, UK Hospitality is a trade association for the UK hospitality sector. It represents 750 members operating 70,000 venues pre-pandemic and speaks on behalf of cafes, restaurants, as well as a range of hospitality formats, including bowling alleys, contract caterers and leisure parks. Welcome, Tony. Hi, thanks for having us on. Tony, is there really a shortage of staff in UK hospitality? There really, really is a shortage of staff, yes. Um, I really can't state that strongly enough. We estimate it to be around 200,000 roles that are, are empty at the moment. But actually, we've had an acute shortage of staff in hospitality even before COVID came along. And then we've had it since because, well, for a number of reasons. You know, for that last lockdown, for example, a lot of people went back to their countries of origin because hospitality in the UK is fairly heavily augmented with non-British workforce. And a lot of them haven't come back. And that might be just because they think that it's risky in case there's another lockdown, they'll find themselves out of work again. Or some of them can't travel because of the travel restrictions that are in place at the moment. Or they feel that they can't come back because of the immigration system, or they actually cannot come back because of the new immigration system. But that's the foreign workers. And then we've also got some similar factors at play with UK workers, again, not really necessarily having the faith in the sector in the short term, because of course, hospitality is the first to be hit when there's a lockdown. So there's a number of factors there. But then even before the pandemic, we had a shortage. And I think that we've held our hand up and said, actually, do you know what? We haven't sold the sector and careers in the sector very well for some time. And we have to take some blame for that. But it's the perception in the UK of hospitality jobs tends to be a misguided and poor one, really, of just serving pints or waiting tables both of those roles can actually be very very fulfilling anyway but there's so much more than that and the sector is quite a meritocracy so you can go from bar to boardroom in a fairly short time and you, you know you can start collecting pint glasses in a pub and be the general manager within two or three years so we've sold that badly as well so in short what is the solution Oh, <laughs> there's no one solution. I mean, one of those things is really working and it will be take a long time. So it's not a solution in the short term, but working to actually promote the, the great careers that there are in hospitality, you know, social marketing managers, you know, there's legal sides to it. I think in the short term, you know, the government is, uh, I'm not criticizing here, but we will have personal views on it. But I think the government is 
understandably wedded to its new immigration system because it's what it came up with and it's on what they won an election on at the back of, I suppose. But we really do have to look because of the acute nature of the problem to some sort of bypassing of that, whether it's youth mobility visas stitched into trade deals with India and other countries or whatever it is. You know, there's lots of different ways. And I think there's also a need to, and the government has recognised this and is working with us on this, actually a need to go back to schools and actually remind people that making food and entertaining people and, and hospitality generally is a good career. And it's for many people. We've always had a lot of people passing through hospitality, you know, short term jobs. And I think that will always be the case. But at least we ought to recognise the fact that when they do that, when they leave hospitality jobs, they've taken on what is, um, I think, regrettably often called soft skills, but very important skills of people management, you know, dealing with different situations, customers or non-customers situations. And it's a sector with a lot to offer people. Great. Thanks, Tony, for joining us here today on Fifth Wave. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So the UK hospitality sector has a gap of 200,000 jobs that urgently need to be filled due to the impacts of Brexit, immigration policies and COVID. It's a tough challenge that may take years to address. But this isn't the whole story either. Long-term hospitality professionals in the UK and elsewhere have been rethinking their careers during their time on furlough and a period of unemployment. I would love to share with you now a conversation I had with Freddie Speed, a brilliant hospitality professional I know personally, and an example of the type of talent this industry needs to retain. Freddie has most recently been managing the evening service for an up-and-coming London restaurant after 10 years building a career in five-star hotels and other premium venues. But the downtime caused by COVID is leading him to try out an alternative career in HR. Let's find out why. Hi, Freddie. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for having me. Yeah, great. Well, perhaps you could give us a little bit of background on your career and how you started in hospitality. Yeah, I'm still relatively young, just 27. I've managed to accumulate 10 years in hospitality so far, though. Went to university, did a very generic business management degree, but it inspired me to do nothing. So when I came out, you know, I just had to look at what actually I was interested in, having spent, you know, portions of my childhood in Thailand and Dubai. I was very lucky to experience quite an array of incredible hospitality experiences and it just it always blew my mind so I just decided to go into that so I moved to London went into the first five-star hotel that I could get a job at worked up from host to commie waiter all the way up to duty manager um, of a hotel in South Kensington then moved over to be restaurant manager for a uh, private members club in Mayfair then went over to Ministry of Sound to be operations manager for their site the ministry and then I I Took on a, a really ambitious cafe and brunch place by day and uh, restaurant by evening. So took on general manager position there. And that's where I'm at the moment. And what are some of your personal hobbies or passions that you engage in just to sort of a broader part of your life? First, I mean, I'm obsessed with sport, watching, playing, reading. You know, if I'm not working, I'm probably doing one of those things. I'm currently training for London Marathon to raise money for Anti Nolan, uh, which is a great charity. And then apart from that, you know, socializing is probably, you know, I love seeing friends and being able to relax after a, a nice shift. So tell us about your plans to make a pause from the industry. What are you thinking? Uh, I genuinely have such fondness towards this industry. I really do. I always speak about it very passionately. But to be honest, I think COVID just gave me so much time off, you know, Thankfully, the government had the furlough scheme and it it just gave me so much time to reflect on what was actually missing in my life from the previous six years that I'd been in London. You know, since the day I arrived in London, I've been in hospitality, you know, working 60, 65 hour weeks and you just lose track of everything else. And you're, you're very happy in that bubble. It's your own little world. You know, you only socialize with the people that you're working with because you're all working the same hours. And so having a lot of time to reflect, you know, catching up with a lot of old friends, you know, meeting up with you know some of my best friends who've got married and I hadn't met their wife yet and I mentioned sports and playing sports since I've been in London I haven't been able to join a single sports team and I would love the opportunity to know that I'm going to be off on a certain day and you know join a cricket club on a Sunday or join a -a five-a-side football team on a Tuesday evening. I've decided to you know step back from hospitality I want to you know try at least having a Monday to Friday you know a nine-to-five job see how that feels. 
Do you think your experience is unique? It's very individual. I mean, in hospitality, I'm sure that this is the same across the board. I mean, I would say probably about 75% of the people that I've worked with in this industry to date have all had an external passion, whether it's art or acting or singing, and they're just biding their time with hospitality. COVID gave a lot of people with those passions a lot of time to do extra of those, you know. I know a lot of artists who have put stuff on Etsy, for example, and they've been able to step out of hospitality because they've started making enough money on that. I understand you're now looking into becoming a HR professional. Yeah, so I've started, I've actually already enrolled onto the CIPD Level 5, which is the Chartered Institute for Personnel Development course, which will hopefully put me in fairly good stead with my experience of HR in hospitality that I've dealt with so far. What do you think owners and operators need to do to ensure that they keep talent like you in this very competitive race for talent? At the moment, with the problems with COVID and Brexit, to keep these staff, you need to invoke loyalty. You need to you know, make sure that they are feeling valued. And that's the places that I've worked for that have been exceptional. They're doing that. They're investing in their staff, not just with their pay packet, but they're giving them trainings. You know, I got my Wine and Spirits Education Trust Level 2 when I was just a waiter at my first job. And, you know, that, that level of investment in me at that time, it just felt massive. And, I, you know, it, it replaced any money that they probably could have given me at the time. And even though I'm sure it didn't actually cost them that much, you know, it still felt like a really big step for them to take and for me to take. So I think it's about showing your team that you value them. Not every company, you know, can afford to just increase pay for every member of staff like that, which is, you know, which is what's being expected in this industry at the moment, which is impossible. You know, you'll see 50% of the restaurants and bars and clubs and, you know, they'll all just go under if that's what needs to happen. I think the clever businesses now will be investing in showing value, you know, whether it's getting, uh, you know, your most experienced member of staff, writing trainings for the team, you know, paying that one person extra money for them to provide the trainings for the rest of the team, you know, or putting them onto the course and then them relaying it back to the, I think it's, those are the clever little tricks that I think now businesses are going to have to adapt because the market for recruitment at the moment is unsustainable, in my opinion. Well, Freddie, thanks for being with us here today. Freddie Speed, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Freddie leaving the hospitality scene is a huge loss for our industry. And it's a loss being felt by restaurants, cafes, and other hospitality venues around the world. And so now let's speak with two coffee chains to understand their current experiences with staffing shortages and what they're doing to find solutions. We start with Jessica Warden, head of coffee for Gales, an artisan bread and coffee chain across the UK. Originally from the Netherlands, Jessica began her career creating art and running an art space, working part-time in coffee, and then joined Gales in London after her master's. At the time, Gales had only three stores. Now, 10 years later, Gales has just opened its 70th location. Just sort of kicking off. What is unique about Gales? When you see so many other businesses and how they grow and transform and, and become better at what they do, you see a lot of businesses turn around and try their hand at doing different things. And I think what's really unique about Gales is that we we understand what we're good at. We we are really fantastic bakers and we're really fantastic baristas. So we're ultimately, we're, we're craftspeople. So it's about working really closely with our chain of producers, partners to find the absolute best ingredients and then do our bit, our absolute best to make them taste as beautiful as possible. Uh, and I think that's what's really unique about what we do. Do you see a staff shortage out there in the marketplace? I think the UK hiring landscape is really challenging at the moment. So you do see uh, fewer people applying for jobs than they would historically. But when it comes to Gales, one of the things uh, that I think is uh been a, a really beneficial development from the pandemic as it's forced us to really reassess how we support learning and development in our teams. And historically, we had a dedicated training space where we would do all of our training. 
And that was all delivered by a very small team that were constantly calibrated. And in response to the pandemic, we saw a continuing need to train and develop people. So one of the things that we introduced was over a period of three months, we tested, trialed, and then introduced and embedded an on-site training program. So working with the head baristas in each bakery to give them the tools that they needed to constantly test their own understanding and transform the bakery environment into a site of continuous learning and development and also inspiration building for the wider teams. If we could just step back a bit and look at maybe what are the reasons behind perhaps the challenging environment for staff? To what extent would Brexit be a factor in terms of sort of hiring staff at at the moment? So Brexit's definitely had an impact on the job pool. And we started to see that when even before the vote. So fewer and fewer people from Europe were moving to London in search of jobs. And so we have seen uh, a shift in our London bakeries in terms of who's applying for jobs. If you look outside of London, the landscape is very different. And in some ways, it's not significantly changed. With fewer people, you know, moving to London in search of jobs, it means that the people you have applying for jobs are are usually British. It's it's actually a really uh, fantastic opportunity to uh, attract people who may not have prior experience. One of the things I hear constantly is, oh, how are we going to attract the right people with the right skill set? And I would say at Gales, our focus has always been to attract the right people who will fit well in our culture and and really get what we want to do. So really feel excited about being part of a craft business and grasp every learning and development opportunity to push themselves forward. And so when it comes to our hiring strategy, it's always been about finding the right people because the skills you can build. And I think that's one of the things that has always been so inspirational about specialty coffee. I mean, my background is in the arts and what I always found so exciting about teaching in the arts was that you could find ways of unlocking people's potential. And there was often like an immediate sense of validation. And coffee is, for me, has been really, really similar. When you show someone how to pull an espresso, when they finally get how to dial in and have something that just tastes absolutely amazing, helping people understand that they're actually really great tasters Mm. and they have that sensory skill set. It's just about training their palate. Like those sorts of things are so inspirational and being in a position to attract people who've never, never had access to that before and introduce something really special that they can do is so powerful. Wow. And, and so when it comes to finding people with the right skills, I would say it's more about finding people who want the right opportunities. How do you feel that COVID-19 has impacted availability of staff, attitudes towards working in hospitality, et cetera? COVID has definitely had an impact on the landscape. So we've seen also a lot of people choose to move back home, whether that's move out of London to another part of the UK, to move out of London to another country in Europe. So we we have seen that. But at the same time, because Gales had an opportunity to stay open throughout the different lockdowns because uh, we're a bakery. We also saw that a lot of the people who work for us were able to tangibly experience the impact of staying open and continuing to work. And it's changed so much since I started. Uh, When I started, the working practices, they were really dangerous. You had a lot of people with uh, repetitive strain injuries that would occur over time. And one of the first things I I did when I started looking 
you know, developing our training program was looking at how we could make what we do as accessible as possible for a really diverse audience. Mm. Uh, so when I started, the people who were training, designing bars, those were all designed and developed for bigger bodies. You know, all, all of these programs, uh, a lot of the training were led by men who didn't really understand what yeah. it was like to work if you were, you know, half a foot shorter. So I think th those sorts of things are um, what's really exciting about where coffee is going. It's really transforming it from something people did as a, a side hustle to earn money in between university and your your dream career to suddenly being something that you can do long term. Well, that's a great way to lead it. Thank you very much, Jessica, for joining us here today on Fifth Wave. <laughs> oh, thank you for having me. Based on my interview with Jessica, the trick to solving the staffing crisis is being clear about the values you stand for and hiring those very people who embrace your vision. And in Gail's case, craft is clearly the central theme and training is a fundamental part of their success. Finally, let's cross the ocean to hear an American perspective. We're speaking with Jonathan Rubinstein, founder and CEO of Joe Coffee. Jonathan is one of the early pioneers of the New York coffee scene, opening his first cafe 18 years ago in Greenwich Village. Joe Coffee now has 20 cafes, a roastery, e-commerce coffee business, as well as catering and public education offerings. Joe Coffee is now part of the Union Square Hospitality Group, run by well-respected restaurateur Danny Mayer, which includes some of the world's most successful restaurants, including Gramercy Tavern, Union Square Cafe, and the legendary Shake Shack chain. Now let's hear how Joe Coffee navigated the sudden impact of COVID and the staff shortages experienced on reopening. Welcome, Jonathan. It's great to be here. Thank you. COVID had a really big impact on the world of coffee. What was the impact on your business? At the beginning, like most other coffee companies, we had to close down our retail operations completely. We had to terminate or lay off almost our entire staff, everybody at the retail level and everybody but the most skeleton of a crew at the headquarters level because we still had some things that we had to keep going, mostly in terms of becoming an unemployer, as we called ourselves, to try to put all of our energy into helping our people. So setting up GoFundMe campaigns for them, being there to try to guide them to find other jobs, telemarketing jobs, navigate the very challenging unemployment processes that were happening. It was really like our job was to work for our people since we couldn't do anything for our business except, you know, renegotiate with our landlords and try to get coffee out in the mail to our customers. We did learn that empathy and working for your people do create rewards and loyalty and that a lot of people did come back because they felt like we had taken care of them and then they wanted to, to help take care of us. And then about three and a half months later, we started to reopen the cafes slowly over the course of, I guess you could say a year, but the majority of them opened over the course of last summer. And at this point now, and we're speaking at the end of July, we have all but one of the cafes open again and all of the other departments are running. Where are you in terms of volume compared to pre-COVID times? I'd say on average, we're probably at 75% of what we were doing in 2019, which is, you know, we're both thankful for it because we, we see ourselves making it, but we all are certainly not making money really at most cafes because, as we know, the margins are uh, very slim and you really count on 100% of what you've budgeted or you've done in the past and that final 20, 25%, that's really where the economics work. What's the situation with staff? Does New York have the same level of staff shortages that we hear in other parts of the world, especially here in the UK? That has been the most difficult part of reopening. And I'm sure that people who are in the coffee industry know that there's a tremendous amount of skill that goes into a barista being a really competent, excellent barista. And uh, there's a lengthy training process. And in our case, we did lose the majority of the staff that we had. We were at probably close to 250 store level employees before we closed. And of those, 
less than 100 came back at least at the beginning. So in order for us to open the cafes, but also open the cafes with the same standards and qualities as when we closed them, we had to really scramble to try to hire people. And that was quite a daunting task. Not only was it very difficult to hire people because of the way that some of the unemployment laws have worked here, where it can be more lucrative not to work than to work. But on top of that, there was a very competitive landscape for bringing people back financially at a time where many coffee companies were losing money already. So to really up the labor was a very challenging conundrum for most coffee companies. And then to all of a sudden have to train dozens upon dozens upon dozens of people when a training team is tight and the training space is tight and to have to do it all at once and throw people into the fire to all of a sudden also deal with the logistics and bar flow and things like that was very, very difficult. And a year later, to be honest, is still difficult. Uh, we're still interviewing and hiring like, like we've never before we certainly are seeing more turnover than we saw before the pandemic. And while I do think the quality of people we have hired is there, it has been much harder to land people. And we've had to interview many more people for each position that we've hired than we have in the past for all the obvious reasons. People have left in New York. They're not here for school right now. If they're qualified, they can really take their pick of cafes or companies they want to work for. And it is still a period of time where people can collect unemployment and enjoy themselves and travel and look at other options. Not to mention many people in the service industry here, particularly at the general manager level, have decided to try other careers and have understandably felt like maybe it was their chance to explore something totally different. So what are the opportunities for baristas and coffee professionals going forward? The amount of opportunity that exists right now has never been seen before. For someone who's good, who has wanted that next step to become a roaster, a trainer, a general manager, where they can make significantly more money. Most of the colleagues that I know in at least New York or National Coffee, we are still having trouble filling these jobs. And someone who maybe used to make $15 an hour and tips, but always had their eye on the $19 an hour job as cafe lead, they're open for people who are good, who want to be promoted quickly. You know, we have two cafes now that have not had general managers in them for a quarter of a year because we cannot find qualified people. And we're just sort of running them saying, as soon as we find someone, as soon as we find someone. Do you think this shortage of staff is going to be a, a long-term challenge for the industry? I don't think it's going to be long term as in many years, but I certainly think for the next 12 to 18 months, all of us will continue to sort of be really rebuilding a consistent staff who will have longevity and really have this, the skill set and the investment that is different than when all of a sudden your cafe is filled with 10 baristas and nine of them have only been with you a few months. It's something very different than the feel of a staff who's been seasoned and there for you know, on average two, three years or more, not to mention sort of the connection to the customers, the hospitality, the regulars who have the relationships. Those are all intricate reasons for a cafe's success and really feeling like they're of the community and well-oiled machines. And I do think there are people who have worked in coffee for a long time and possibly thought at some point, I'm going to look at other options and reevaluate my life or reevaluate where I live. And I think COVID has been a time that it's forced people to do just that. And there are people, uh, in, certainly in our company, who have decided that now is the time to apply to school, to move upstate, to try an office job, uh, to find a job where they can work from home. And, you know, we respect that. But from a business perspective, that has been really very challenging. Now, you've always been, as far as we could see, you know, one of those companies that trained so many thousands of people, you know, all across America, mm. you know, especially than the New York scene. So many people did their early days at Joe Coffee. How do you think the sort of the training process is going to change as a result of an entirely new era now? 
that also was very challenging in the beginning. So we, when we reopened our stores a year ago and had to train, I think our goal was to train 40 people within about a month and a half, and that is a lot of people. We have a training team of three people, but the mask wearing was difficult when you look at taste and touching the same cups and being very close to people, all the things that are necessary to really do a strong training. And what we were forced to do was to train in much smaller groups with lots of safety protocols in place. And so we had to revert to one-on-one -on -one training, which is what we used to do before we put together small group training. Well, I don't have to tell you that when your training program is roughly 30 hours and you have one trainer for every one potential barista, it's very time consuming. It's very, very expensive, but we didn't see ourselves having a choice if we wanted to get the cafes open. So that's what we did. And then slowly over the last year, as the protocols have changed, we've been able to relax that a little bit and do small group training again with people who are fully vaccinated. And that's sort of where we are right now. Wonderful. Thanks, Jonathan, for being here today on Fifth Wave. Great to talk to you. Despite being such a supportive unemployer, as Jonathan mentioned, only 100 of their former staff returned out of 250 pre-COVID. This gives a sense of the scale of movement of staff and the number of coffee professionals who are reconsidering their careers in hospitality. The upside of all this is that there has never been a better time for experienced, hardworking and talented coffee professionals to step up and fast track their careers. And that's all this week for the Fifth Wave podcast. Please subscribe to Fifth Wave wherever you get your podcast, And we'd really appreciate a review and good rating if you enjoyed this show. Also, get in touch and tell us what topics are important to you so we can make the show more relevant to you and to your business. You can follow the link in the show notes to worldcoffeeportal.com slash fifth wave. This episode was recorded in the one and only Serendipity Studios in glorious Camden, North London. It was produced by myself, Jeffrey Young, the World Coffee Portal team, James Harper of Filter Productions, and sound engineering by Chris Bristow. And today we leave you with a beautiful track called New York Makes Me Cry by talented artist Abriel Scharf, former finalist in the Coffee Music Project New York City. Have a great week, and until next time, stay safe and stay caffeinated. Watching the rain fall on my lap Bullets on pavement like on tap Coffee on every corner People hold paper cups for quarters Tattoo the name, try to wash it off Take the long way and miss your stop Did you put up a good fight? New York makes me cry Every day, cage birds sing Where'd you get that voice? Where'd you get those words? ATMs in strangers' pockets Where our hearts like broken lockets Tattoo the name, try to wash it off Take the long way and miss your stop Did you put up a good fight? New York makes me cry talk worth people pleasing and getting lost say you'll give it one more try tattoo the name try to wash it off take the long way and miss your stop gonna put up a good fight but new york makes me cry